Welcome to Concrete 101, Quality Assurance and Quality Control Mythbusters Edition. The manufactured concrete product industry has been around for over 100 years, and we have plenty of myths to prove it. Today we are focusing in on quality assurance and quality control, a very important and sometimes misunderstood area that has developed many lazy, crazy, and sometimes quite plausible but mistaken practices. This video will focus on how to do QA, QC the right way with selected practical QC tests that can be relatively easily and inexpensively implemented. So first, what's the difference between QA, quality assurance, and QC, quality control? While we often use these terms interchangeably, quality assurance refers to the overall quality program that tells us what steps we need to take and what targets we need to hit to assure that we are making good products. On the other hand, quality control refers to the implementation of the quality program and the actual tests we do on an ongoing basis to make sure that we are hitting our targets and what corrective actions to take if we aren't hitting those targets. An important but sometimes overlooked aspect of QA, QC programs is that they're only as good as they are implemented. QA, QC needs to be a habit, something we do every day. A top-notch plan is no good at all if it only exists in a file nobody reads or follows. We recommend starting simply and focusing on items that can be incorporated into daily routines with current personnel. Quality control is a very broad topic that we can split into three areas. First is raw materials. We must use good quality, consistent raw materials because garbage in equals garbage out. Using inconsistent, out of spec, or unsound materials makes it likely that we'll have problems down the road. Second is inline measurements. These are tests that we do on the wet side during production. In other words, right after we make the product and before it's cured. This is the most effective way to identify and correct problems. If we hit our wet size targets, we can ensure that our final products will meet our expectations. Last is final product properties. While it's important to periodically test our products to confirm that they meet our expectations, at this point it is really too late for true quality control. Today, in part one, we'll focus on quality control of our raw materials. We'll explore a couple of myths and determine if they are plausible confirmed, or just plain busted. Next time in part two, we'll move on to inline measurements and final product properties. But before we jump into raw materials, let's look at our first myth, that only QC folks and machine operators need to know anything at all about concrete or raw material quality. So here's a true story about a block plant in Rhode Island that was having intermittent low strength issues. Every so often, the chippage and scrap piles would just explode, followed later by customer complaints about cracks and low quality block. One November, they had a huge customer crisis and called in all the suppliers. One supplier rep noticed the loader operator cleaning the yard, picking leaves and other debris off the ground. Then with the yard waste still in the bucket, the operator went over to the sand pile, loaded up and dumped the sand along with the yard waste into the hopper. Now the loader operator thought he was doing a good job cleaning the yard. He had no idea that the organic material like the leaves would severely affect the strength of the concrete block and result in a large claim against the company. So let's start with the raw material that takes up the most volume in our mix, the aggregates or sand and stone. The most important test we can do is regular sieve analysis of our aggregates to make sure they are consistent from week to week and month to month. If our aggregates are not consistent, then the texture and overall quality of our products will not be consistent either. ACM recommends that you do weekly sieve analysis on each of your aggregates if you have the resources to do that. None of this is rocket science. It's mostly common sense that can sometimes get lost through lack of training, time pressure, or just plain laziness. The reason for all these steps in the process is because we need to make sure that the small sample that we end up sieving is representative of the whole pile. Why go to all the trouble of doing a sieve analysis if the results don't tell us anything about the aggregates we're actually using? Here are some of the highlights of the sieve analysis. 
How we sample is really important. As you see in the graphic, sample the pile from the red zone. You don't want to sample in the blue areas near the bottom of the pile because the larger aggregate particles tend to roll down and collect here when the aggregate is dumped. So a sample taken from the bottom of the pile will be coarser than the actual pile. Use a tube sampler to get into the pile and sample three to five locations. Take a larger sample than needed so it can be properly split using the quartering method or a ruffle splitter to obtain a representative sample. Screens and shakers should be clean and in good working order. This equipment takes a beating during normal use, so it needs to be maintained and replaced on a regular basis. For detailed instructions on how to do a sieve analysis, we recommend watching the YouTube video on ASTM C136 from Gilson Company. Besides doing regular sieve analysis of the aggregates, there are two other tests you may want to consider. If you have an aggregate with lots of clay or super fine material, perhaps the limestone screenings or dredge sand, you can get a quick idea of how much super fine material it is by doing a clay content test. As shown here, you put some aggregate in a mason jar with water, shake it up and let it settle for four to eight hours. The bigger particles fall to the bottom of the jar, followed by a fine silt layer, and finally the clay or super fine layer on the top. If this layer is over 1 8 to 1 quarter inch or varies a lot from load to load, you may want to look further into this issue. Too much superfine material in your aggregates can make the concrete mix sticky and hard to run and contribute to low strengths. If you get natural sands and want to ensure they've been properly washed, you can do the ASTM C40 test for organic impurities. This involves putting some aggregate in a jar with a 3% sodium hydroxide solution shaking it up and let it sit for 24 hours. If the sand has organic impurities, it will turn the liquid yellow to brown. By comparing the color to the reference standards, you can determine if the organic impurity level is too high, which can cause issues ranging from low strength to discoloration on light colored products in the field. Now let's talk about cement. The first thing you want to do is get a mill test report or mill cert on a monthly basis. Mill certs contain chemical and physical analysis of the cement. The thing to remember is that they are a snapshot and represent a large quantity of cement produced over a month's time. They may not be exactly what you got in any particular load. Mill certs are most valuable to see how consistent the cement is over time or to get an idea of how a new cement might compare to your current supplier. ACM can help you decipher all the information on your mill cert. Pozzolans, like fly ash or slag, also have mill test reports. They usually have less chemical information, but may contain other information like strength activity index. Again, they may be most valuable for comparison purposes. Now, onto the color. The color of your cement, fly ash, and slag have a big impact on the final color of your finished products, even the gray units. Color is a major driver of the consumer purchasing decision, so if it's not as expected, problems may follow. Obviously, we use our eyes to check color, but it may surprise you to know that cement mill certs can give clues about color as well. First is the iron, or Fe2O3 content. The higher the iron, the darker the cement. And second is the blain fineness. The higher the blain, the finer the cement is ground, and the lighter the cement color will be. Mill certs are a start, but at some point you need your eyes, and sometimes even eyes need some help. We set Dean and Allison the challenge of testing cement color difference with a little friendly competition thrown in. Of course, Dean thinks he has a winning solution, and he's brought in a Mythbusters ringer to help. Making a special guest appearance, Buster, the crash test dummy, always ready to volunteer for a good cause. So I am certain that Allison is going to have some scientific kind of test on how does the color of cement affect the color of concrete. Well, as I showed you a little bit before, there are two different colors of cement we've got. 
uh, on Buster's left hand, we've got the lighter colored cement. On Buster's right hand, we've got the darker colored cement. Put a little gas in there because that's how I roll. And uh, we're going to try this uh, trial by fire. Normally, I'd be using my chainsaw, but there's really just no place to use a chainsaw today. But instead, we're going to use the old torch. So let's light it up. Uh, anybody got a fire extinguisher? Hey, both are still on fire back here. I don't know, that wasn't too bad, was it? So as you can see here, Buster's just a little bit worse for the wear. Uh, maybe you should have a little bit bigger fire extinguisher, that's all I'm saying. But if you look here, Allison, look at that. Still a little bit lighter colored. Still a little bit darker. I don't know if that proves anything, but it sure is fun. So anyway, kids, don't try this at home. All right? There's another myth busted. So that's Dean and Buster's take on cement color. On a more serious note, how can you tell if these two fairly similar looking cements might cause color issues in your finished products? Let's go to Allison, who is going to show us how to do a simple, inexpensive check to determine the true difference in the color of these cements. So let's do the donut test. All you need is a picture frame. You can get these from CVS, $9.99. Bet you can do better than that. So you take two glass frames and you take your two cement samples. Take a scoop of one and put it in the center. Kind of spread that out. And then you're going to make a hole in the center of there. That's going to create your donut. Then you take your second sample Put that in the center. Now looking at it right now, you can't really tell the difference. You can see there's a slight difference in the colors, which can affect your concrete. Then you take the frame, you smash it down, and now you can clearly see that there's a difference in the colors of the cement. Thanks, Allison. If we just look at these two cement samples, we can see a slight color difference. But when we do the cement donut test, we can clearly see the dramatic color difference between the two cements. To demonstrate how this can impact our final product color, we made up two concrete samples that are identical except for the cement. You can see the significant difference in color that the cement makes. This would surely make a difference if the pavers of both of these colors were installed on the same job. You'd have one unhappy customer. So the myth that cement color does not affect concrete color is busted. So let's summarize what we learned today in a couple of myths that were busted. First, it's not true that only the QC folks and the machine operators need to know about the QA QC program. Everybody, from the forklift drivers in the yard to the front office folks taking the orders, need to know our commitment to quality throughout our production process. From raw materials to QC checks during production. And an effective QAQC program needs to be a habit, something we do every day. On the raw materials side, it's important to do ongoing sieve analyses of our aggregates to check load to load consistency. We can also do tests for excessive amounts of clay in very fine materials and to verify that they are properly washed and free of organic impurities. For cement and pozzolans, we can compare monthly mill certs and do a quick and easy test to check our cement color if we think it's varying load to load or if we're considering looking at a new source of supply. This helps bust the second myth. That is, that the color of cement doesn't impact the final color of our concrete products. In fact, a change in the color of our cement can have a significant change on the color. That's it for today. Next time in part two, We'll look at inline measurements, which are tests we do on the wet side during production to help us make quality products that meet the strength and durability requirements our customers expect. So that's all for today, folks. But feel free to check back with us anytime on our website, acmchem.com, where you can get more information and more videos on Concrete 101.
extinguisher. Let me play with that for just a minute. Just a little extra duty. You still going? I hope that's it. We're all out. Okay. So you can stop it now. Bad, wasn't it?